first of all, chemistry is looking at um, matter and the changes that it undergoes. When we're looking at matter, we want to know what is it made up of and how does it change over time. Matter itself is anything that has volume and takes up, uh, which means it takes up space and also has mass. Um, matter can exist in various different states of matter. Within chemistry, there are five main areas. Organ organic chemistry looks at substances that are based on carbon, whereas inorganic chemistry focuses on the rest of the compounds that are not based in carbon. Analytical chemistry uh, looks at the composition of substances. It also looks very carefully at um, the amounts of the substance. Measurement is very key in analytical chemistry. Physical chemistry is much more theoretical. We look at the theories behind the experiments that we're looking at, and biochemistry looks at living things. Compounds can be changed into simpler substances through a process, which would be a chemical change. And here are some different examples that I'm sure you're familiar with. Table salt. SiO2 is the formula for sand. Fool's gold, pyrite is the name of that. Water and sugar. It all has a set composition of elements in a specific ratio. For example, in sugar, or in this case sucrose, it's C12H22O11. If you change the amount of oxygen, you'd have a different substance. Elements cannot be changed into simpler substances. Like I mentioned before, the, this is the fundamental component of matter. There's around 117 elements, give or take. Um, they cannot be subdivided into simpler substances, and here are several examples. Sodium, chlorine, hydrogen, silicon, oxygen, and iron. Now, there are two types of elements. There are uh, monatomic elements. And if we put this together and just do the A, that's fine. Those would be examples like sodium and silicon and iron here. Notice that there's just one atom. There are also some diatomic elements, and you see two of them are listed here. We have hydrogen. We have oxygen. And there's a total of seven elements that exist in this manner. I'll list them for you. Well, that should be a two, excuse me. Chlorine, fluorine. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and the last one I'm forgetting is nitrogen. So hydrogen, oxygen, bromine, iodine, chlorine, fluorine, and nitrogen are the seven diatomic elements. Now a side note down here, it says when elements become part of a compound, their original properties like color, hardness, melting point are replaced. It says consider table salt. Sodium is a metal. And I'm going to write here, it's a solid that is uh, explosive in water. Chlorine is a gas that is poisonous, and it's green. So this is an explosive metal. Chlorine is a poisonous gas. When you put them together, they form sodium chloride, table salt. And as you know, that's neither poisonous, nor is it explosive when you put it into water. So the chemical properties completely change when you form a new compound. Let's look at this a little bit. Um, we're going to sort these out into elements. We're going to use the letter E for element, C for compound. If it's a homogeneous mixture, meaning it has a uniform composition throughout, we're going to write homo. Homo means same. And if it's a heterogeneous mixture, meaning that it has different components that you can identify, we're going to use the term hetero, meaning different. So oxygen, ask yourself, is this a pure substance? Yes, it is. Um, and it is not a compound, it is just an element. Air, is it a pure substance? Is it always the same? No, air can vary a little bit. It might be made of um, more particulate matter if, if you're looking at the air in a, a busy urban area. So air can vary. This is a mixture. Is it um, uniform throughout? Can you see things in it? Probably not. So it's most likely a, homo a homogeneous mixture. Blood is also a mixture. Can you see components in it? You cannot. It's uniformly uh, distributed, so we'll say homogeneous mixture there. Brass. It is an alloy, meaning a blend of these two metals, copper and zinc. Can you separate those easily? Not really. It, they're melted together, so it is also a homogeneous mixture. Lots of homogeneous mixtures. In fact, mixtures are probably more abundant than elements and compounds. Now, carbon monoxide. When I see this, I see the element carbon, 
and I see oxide, which is the element um, oxygen, this is the formula for it. If it has a chemical formula, um, it is a compound. So again, if it has a chemical formula of two or more elements, it is a compound. Now, talking about the scientific method, um, here I have a little diagram of this um, student doing an experiment. And these words are kind of dancing around in his head. Um, scientific method is really just a way to solve a problem. It's um, done within all science and research. It's a process that begins with one of these things. Either we have a problem, we're curious, we might have a question, or we might have a need. This is also how inventions take place. Any developments in medicine or in technology are driven by the scientific method. So let's just say that we're going to start here. We're going to do some research, or maybe you've just, um, you're just you familiar with a problem. So find a problem. Let's say that your cell phone battery does not last long enough. That certainly is an issue. We're going to make a hypothesis that perhaps the battery is not um, large enough. So should we get a larger battery? We'll do some experiments with large batteries. We'll compile data. We'll form a conclusion. Did that work? Did a larger battery give us greater battery life? Maybe we'll find an answer. Okay, so larger batteries give longer battery life. However, maybe that gives us another problem. Do people want larger batteries in their cell phones? Probably not. They probably would prefer a battery that's lighter and sleeker. So this is um, a continuous process where we are constantly going around in this cycle. There are some terms that are going to come up within the scientific method. Some of these terms are tricky. Hypothesis, theory, and law. First of all, I want to talk about what hypothesis is within the scientific method. Sometimes when we're out of the science classroom, hypothesis and theory are used incorrectly. So this is a prediction of what will happen. And a hypothesis is based on what you already know. So it is a prediction. A theory is not a prediction. This happens after the experiment is concluded. Okay, so the experiment is complete, and we're looking at all of our data, and we're trying to summarize what we've learned. So this is an explanation, explanation of what has occurred. We would here try to explain why. Why is something happening? So here's, here's the thing that I dislike about the way these two terms are confused. Sometimes people say, oh, I have a theory about why this will happen. Really, a theory happens after the fact. If you want to talk about what happens before the experiment, you need to talk about what your hypothesis is. So this is before versus after. People also get theory and law confused. A theory is an explanation. Um, it is also, you can think of this as a summary. Whereas this is a statement. of what occurs. Um, it doesn't attempt to explain why. Sometimes this is used to explain natural phenomenon. Um, we don't use laws um, very frequently in chemistry. Every once in a while we do, um, going into second semester, we'll discuss a few. Now, qualitative and quantitative, these words can be easily confused. I want you to look carefully. Qualitative, we're looking at qualities. And quantitative, we're looking at quantities. So if we're looking at quality, this might be the color, the odor. Okay. When we're looking at quantities, this would be something that's numeric. The mass, or perhaps the temperature. Now control and constant are two words that are often confused as well, probably because they look similar, C-O-N, C-O-N. Now control, let's think about a control group. Let's say that we're doing an experiment with a new drug that's used for um, the treatment of cholesterol. So let's say five are given the new medication. And then five are given a placebo. 
So this is like a, a placebo would be a sugar pill that wouldn't affect them at all. So of this group of 10 people, five are given new medication, five are given the placebo, which of these is the control group? The control group is the one that um, doesn't have the variable in question. So the one that's given the placebo is called the control group. Because what we want to look at specifically is how does this new medication help these people or not? Okay, the constant would be things that you keep the same. For example, in this experiment with the people taking this medication for cholesterol, you could um, keep their amount of sleep the same in both groups. You could keep their amount of uh, food and water the same in both groups so that you know what's occurring in the experiment is due only to the medication, not due to all these other variables that are going to be held constant. Now, talking about measurement, let's look at this example. Does it make sense? 2 minus 120 equals 46. So there's something that doesn't make sense. In a measurement, two things are required. We need a number, and we need to have a unit. If we add some units to this, I think it'll start to make more sense. Let's say that it's 2 days minus 120 minutes. Okay, so two days would really be, let's say it's 48 hours. Minus 120 minutes would be two hours, which would equal, in this case, 46 must be the number of hours. Okay, now it makes more sense to us. 48 minus two equals 46. If the units are there, which now they're listed, it is okay because you have both the numbers and the units. Don't forget to label your numbers. Now the SI system is the International System of Units and these are the things that are accepted worldwide to measure these specific properties. I've selected a few examples. The ones that are most important to us are the first ones that are listed here. We don't really use amperes, which is the one that's listed at the bottom for electric current. But for mass, we'll use the kilogram and you'll need to be familiar with this abbreviation. For length, we use a meter, m. For seconds, we use s, um, that's our time. Kelvin is the um, unit of measure for temperature. The amount of substance um, is, we use the mole, and the abbreviation is mol.